And if you're new to Discovery or you haven't come during this series, I'm not encouraging you to quit church altogether. What we're encouraging is to, uh, is to quit the, the, the cultural, comfortable Christianity and church that has been, that's developed. And really what we're trying to do is to restore and redeem God's idea of church because culture has influenced us and the body of Christ I believe too much that the church that is and what we have in our mind of what church is, it's just different from what the word of God says church is. So, so for instance, it's just, how many of you guys know that not only is there a culture outside worldly culture, but there's a subculture called church culture. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You know, Christianese, like all that kind of stuff. It's just, it's just things that we think or that we become accustomed to because of traditions and experiences. And that's just the way we do church. That's just the way we do it. And so that's what I'm talking about. It's, it's like, what has developed in our Christianity? What has developed in our relationship with God and our relationship with the church that we need to quit? And let me give you an example. Um, sweet old lady, love her to death. You know, uh, she, a while back, she, uh, this is just one of the examples. This might be a bad example. I hope you don't stone me up here. Okay. But she, she just loves discovery, but she's a pastor. I've never been to a church that doesn't have a cross on the building, or in the, or in the worship center, or anywhere. It's just, it just uh, to me, it's just not a church unless it has the cross. And, and she started breaking out in song, because the old rugged cross, and she started singing on me. I'm like, okay. Um, but so I asked her, I said, okay, but where did you see that in the Bible? Like, where where'd you read that in the Bible that, that, that God's people, that the church needs to have a cross. And now I, I appreciate the symbol of the cross just as much as probably you do and what it means and what happened on the cross. I do. And sometimes we'll have a cross depending on what, it, what, what kind of design that we're going with and stuff like that. But, but if, if you actually look back in the Bible or even in the early church, I, there was no cross anywhere in the early church in their worship gatherings. You know why? Because it was a symbol of death. It was a death penalty. And so it didn't, it didn't, get included into the church until much later when the Catholic church started creating the symbols, which there's nothing, again, nothing wrong with, with symbols and symbolisms. It means something. But I'm just saying, how much of culture are we letting influence our faith in our Christianity instead of the word of God? Amen, somebody, are you with me on this? So we need to quit some things. We just need to quit in order to restore and redeem church to God's idea. There are things that we just need to quit in order to redeem it. So um, this last installment. Let me give you the scripture first of where we're going. Jesus said in Matthew chapter seven, verse 21, he said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So what he's saying is there's, there's gonna be people, a group of people that, that their idea of what it means to follow Jesus is different from God's idea. Like what, they, what, what, what it means to be part of the church or to follow Jesus, it's just, it's different. They had, a, they had a different definition or criteria of what it means to be the church. They won't enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And as a pastor, this is something that I've noticed has, and you probably have as well, just in life. It's, it's on people's mind. People question about heaven and about this afterlife and, and am I going there? And, and all, listen, all over the nation, though, in churches, Christians, believers are uncertain of their faith. They're uncertain of their fate, like where they're going. And because they're uncertain of, of their fate, I'm talking about Christians. This is like, I'm talking about the church people. They're uncertain of what's going to happen to them. Because of that, listen, we approach God based on a sense of obligation, trying to please him out of obligation or duty or religious performance. Or, or even worse, I think, is, is we just try to not even think about it at all. Some people just try not to think about the afterlife. No, don't think about heaven or hell or nothing. Just kind of keep it out of our mind. But if, listen, if we're going to revive and restore the church to God's original design, to, the, to what God's design is, not only do we need to quit expecting earth to be heaven and quit helping out and quit our church friends, but here in this last installment, I'm encouraging you to do this. Write this down. Quit hoping you'll go to heaven. <laughs> quit hoping you will go to heaven. You see, that fear and that uncertainty that you have is keeping you from the confidence, from walking and living in the confidence and under the authority that God has called you to live in. You know, this does not have to be a question mark. 
It does not have to be a mystery for the church, for those of you that are believers, to wonder, am I, oh, I hope I, I hope I go to heaven. This is so important. I'll tell you why this is important. Really, there's, as my role as a pastor, I really have two roles, two parts of my job as a pastor, and, and, and is, it kind of correlates to the two parts of your life. Um, there's two parts of, of your life. The first, the first part, my, my pastor is a metaphor. There's, there's a term in the Bible called, they call a pastor a shepherd. So part of my job as your shepherd is to help guide you through life on earth, is to help lead and guide you. It's just guide you through the seasons, stages, stages of life. Now, truth be known, most of your life is not going to be spent on earth. It's going to be spent in eternity, in the afterlife. But most of what we think about, most of what we talk about are earth things. We're consumed with earth things and, and what we have on earth and what we're going to get on earth and what, what is earth going to give us. And it's not even, it's, it's not the vast majority of where you're going to spend most of your time. So the second part of my job as your pastor is just not to guide you through life, but it's to help prepare you for the afterlife. Are you with me, church? Okay. That's, that's part. If I'm going to be a good pastor, then I'm just not going to help your life here on earth be good and be better, but I'm going to prepare you for what's to come. Um, and the, the vast majority of our life is spent in heaven. So our, our in, the, in the afterlife. So all of us, you guys, please listen. All of us are going to stand before God one day. In fact, in Romans chapter 14, it says it this way. It says, you then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Meaning, why are you worrying about how they're living? Just live, like, worry about your, yourself. Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. So there's going to be a time where you, you're going to have your day in court. You're going to stand before God. You're going to be alone, one-on-one -on -one with God. And then it goes on. It is written, he quotes the scripture, as surely as I live, says the Lord. Look at this. Every knee will bow before me and every tongue will acknowledge. They're going to come to a place where they say, oh my goodness, every religion, every nation, every tribe, every language, they'll come to a place where they go, oh my goodness, Jesus is God. Every tribe, every, every nation. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. So the question is, what does that look like? What does that look like when we give an account to God? I call it the two question test. All right. You, uh, uh, in the afterlife, you, are, you and I, all of us will be presented with a two question test. And some of you are sweating right now because you hate tests. All right. I'm going to help you out. I, I didn't like them very much either. When I was in high school, I wish I could say that I was not a good test taker. That's not the truth. I just wasn't good at school. Okay. I just, I just didn't care. I didn't care about school. All right. There. And because I didn't care, I didn't prepare. And I got bad grades for it. Listen, there's a lot of people in life that don't care about their afterlife. They don't, they don't care about it. Therefore, they're not preparing for it. And listen to me, you're going to fail the test if you don't start caring and preparing. Now, much later in life, when I was like 26 years old, I went back to school, went back to college, and, and I cared a lot more then. I grown up. I was grown up, and I realized that my grades are going to affect my future and my life. I didn't have that. Some of you kids don't understand that. Please, get good grades in school. You don't need to graduate at 28 years old like I did, okay? Get good grades. But I knew. I was like, I cared because I knew this, this means my family, my livelihood, my future. So I prepared, and I got... Good, great. So here's what I want to do. I want to help you prepare for the test. All right? And not only that, not only do I want to help you prepare, check it out, Stephanie. Shh. I'm going to give you the answers to the test. Okay? <laughs> the answer to the... How many of you like those teachers? How many of those teachers that give you the answers to the test? All right? I had a teacher in college that would knock whenever it got to the... To the, to the he would go, you need to know this. Right? You ever had that teacher? Listen up to that part. So here, check it out, guys. This is going to be on the test. I'm telling you, it's coming. You better pay attention. I'm just trying to prepare you for these questions that are coming your way. So here they are. Here's the first question. And without a doubt, I don't know how it's going to be stated, but something like this. God is going to say, the first question, when we, get, when we stand before God, he's going to say, what did you do with my son, Jesus? So I sent him to earth to pay for sins, and sins are going to have to be paid for. They have to be paid for. And most people, though, they're going to pay for their own sins. All right, which is, which is a tragedy because hell, listen, a lot of people have the wrong idea of hell. Hell is not a place that God sends people that he's mad at. That's not what happens. God's not like, I'm, I'm fed up with you. Get out of my presence. Go to hell. That's not what, that's not what God does. That's not how it's, 
at all, okay? Hell is not a place that God sends people he's mad at or disappointed at. Hell is a place for people to pay for their own sins, but they don't have to because they've already been paid for, okay? It's a place where people didn't, they chose not to receive the payment in full, receive what Jesus had done and pay for it themselves. It is a tragedy because it's something that's already done. So God is gonna say, what did you do with my son, Jesus, what did you do? You know, it's, he's going to say, look, I, I, he, paid, he gave his life for you. And all I asked in return was not perfection, was not religious duty, was just for you to give your life back to him. That's it. So what do, you, what do we do with that, you know? Unfortunately, a lot of people are going to answer that question wrong. They're not going to get it right. Let me help you get it right. Revelation chapter 20, the theology side of this kind of message. I'm going to give you a lot of theology on the first part here, and then we'll get practical On the next side, the theology for the first judgment, the first question, uh, this is called the great white throne judgment. For those of you who like to study theology, the great white throne judgment. Revelation 20 talks about it. This is all the end times kind of, kind of prophecy here in Revelation. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. No one can escape this. This is an everyone judgment. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books. I want you to notice that that's plural, books. You might want to circle that S or underline it. That's important. There are books that were open, but then there was another book, not plural, singular, that was open, which is the book of life. This is the Lamb's book of life. The dead were judged according to what was, according to what they had done as recorded in the books Plural. That's what you don't want to happen. You don't want to be judged according to what was written in the books. You want to be judged according to what was written in the book. You see, what's in the books is everything you have ever done, every sin you've ever committed, every thought you've ever you've ever thought. It's in the books. But what happens when you when you receive Jesus, he erases all of the books and he writes your name in the Lamb's book of life. So you're not judged according to the books, according to what you did in your life, but according to what Jesus did on the cross. Somebody say amen to that, okay? You want to you be judged according to what's in the book, not the books. So in heaven, it's going to go something like this. They're going to open up the books, all these books, and they're going to go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, Jason Hannish. He's not here. Oh, wait, let's check the book. And they're going to open up the book, and they're going to go A, B, C. Oh, here he is, Jason. Come on in. It's going to go something like that, something like that. That's how I picture it in my mind, at least. <laughs> you want to be judged according to what's you guys in, in the book, in, in that singular Singular book. And this is, again, this is an everyone judgment. This is a grace judgment, meaning you can't earn it. We don't deserve it. You can't memorize enough scripture. You can't be kind enough, give enough, serve enough, go to church enough. This one here is all about Jesus. It's all what Jesus did, what he has accomplished on the cross. And if we receive that ourselves, if, we, if we've gotten our name erased from the books and written in the book, so then the question becomes, well, how do I know that my name's in the book? Like the one that matters. How how do I know my name is in that book, right? Because a lot of you are still here and you're hoping, oh, I hope I'll go to heaven. And you're a believer. Oh, I hope my name is, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be an uncertainty or a mystery at all. Let's go back to Matthew, the beginning scripture in Matthew chapter seven and see what Jesus says. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. And then he continues, he says, many, not just a few, but many, will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we do a lot of Christian things? Didn't we do a lot of good things? We prophesied in your name, and in your name we drove out demons, and in your name we performed many miracles. We looked really Christian, and we talked really Christian. But then I'll tell them plainly, Jesus said, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. The Greek word for the know there, that when he says, I never knew you, the Greek word is gnosko. And, that, and what that word means, it doesn't mean a mental up here in your mind. No, it means in here, in your heart, in your soul. I knew God. I was, I, here's the right answer. Let me give you the right answer. Not in your notes, but you should write it down. The only right answer for this question is I loved him personally. What did you do with my son, Jesus? I didn't just sing songs about him. I didn't just read a book about him. I didn't just go to a building that was built for him. I had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I had a, he was my priority relationship. I was committed to him. He was my friend. I loved him personally. That is the only right answer. 
And then that's the first question. That's the first judgment. And then if you answer that question right, you get to come in, into heaven. You, 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 get, you get to come into, you get invited into heaven. So the first judgment determines your eternal destiny, but the second judgment is different. In theology, it's called the judgment seat of Christ, okay? The first one it determines your eternal destiny. The second one does not, okay? The first one is a grace judgment. It's all about what Jesus did. Listen, the second judgment is a works judgment. It's all about how you lived your life on this earth. This is what the question is going to be. I don't know the exact language. I think it's going to go something like this based on the scriptures, and I'll show you. He's going to say, what did you do with what I gave you? Were you a good steward of what I gave you? Because I gave you things in this life. I, not, I gave you even br the breath you breathe. I gave you time. I gave you resources. I gave you gifts. I gave you talents. I gave you, uh, what did you do with all that stuff that I invested and I gave you. So I have a responsibility as your pastor to not just prepare you to answer the first question, but to prepare you to be able to answer this question. When God says, what did you do with what I gave you? Because every one of you, when you're invited into heaven, we are all, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 tells us that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Different judgment. There's a whole different judgment. Now, and this is written to Christians. This is those who are already invited into heaven that each one may receive what is due him. He uses this word due. Like, like in the Greek, that's apodidomai, and that means payback. Like God wants to reward you now. He wants to give you stuff for the things that you've done well in the body, whether good or bad. So God now just wants to bless you. And we see this all over scripture is that, that God wants to reward us. In heaven, there is rewards for us. And I could have gave you a list of different scriptures, but let me give you just one of where Jesus actually said it himself in Matthew chapter 16, verse 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he's done. And this is what confuses a lot of people and a lot of Christians, because on one hand, you go, wait a second, you tell me, you, on one side you say it's all grace, it's all free, and I can't earn it. Yeah, that's heaven. That's all Jesus. That's all grace. You can't earn it. Somebody say amen. amen. But the, you, now, are you telling me my, the way I live my life matters? The way I treat people actually matters? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, it matters in life how you treat people. It matters. And the only right answer that you're going to want to say is something like this, I gave my life away. I gave, what did you do with what I gave you? I gave it away. I gave my life away. I, I figured, I, I lived my life in such a way where I realized my life isn't about my life. That listen, hey, before you, before you know Jesus, the right no, before you know Jesus, your whole life is about finding and knowing Jesus. That's, your, that's what your whole life is about. But once you do know Jesus, once you get on this side and invited into heaven, once you do know Jesus, your whole life, listen, is about helping people find Jesus. That's the priority of our life. That's, the, that's God's priority for his church. Here we are hoping we'll go to heaven. Some, a lot of Christians treat church like fire insurance. If I go to church, I'm, I'm good. I'm going to be spared from, this, from the flames. Church isn't fire insurance. Look, stop treating church like fire insurance and, and start going, let's go rescue some people from the flames. Amen? So here, let me say it this way. Quit hoping, quit hoping you'll go to heaven and start preparing for heaven. Start preparing for heaven. Hey, there's a, first, you, there's a question coming your way. What did you do with my son? Listen, you don't have to pay for your own sins. If you haven't answered that question yet, to be able to say, I know him and love him personally, there's no reason why you need to pay for your own sins. Prepare for heaven. It doesn't need to be a mystery. Give your life. All God wants in return is life for life. Jesus gave his life for you. He wants you to give your life back to him. That's the first question. But the second question, now prepare for heaven. What did you do with what I gave you? Look, the only right answer there is I gave my life away. See, for everything, go back to that, go back to that, give my life away. The only, look, God has given you. So, so he's going to say, what did you do now? But my, my disciple, my Christian, my, my son, my daughter, what'd you do with what I gave you? Because I gave you, I gave you time. 
I gave you time. What did you do? The right answer. I gave my time away to influence people for eternity. That's what it is. You may want to write this down in the side notes. I gave my life away for people. You see, that's the only thing that's going to matter. See, a lot of you are giving your life away. We're giving our life away to something. You're investing your life somewhere. Just a lot of us are investing it into places that won't reward us for eternity. We're, we're giving our life away to things that don't have eternal rewards in heaven. So we're, we're giving our life away for success. We're giving our life away for our career. We're giving our life away for money and for, and for pleasures. And we're giving our life away for all these things, but they do not, they don't reward us in eternity. The only things that will last forever, the two things that will last forever, the Bible says, the word of God will endure forever and people were made forever. That's the only thing that matters. That's the only thing that you and I will be rewarded for in heaven is how we used whatever God gave us to leverage and influence people for eternity. That's it. So your time, I gave it away to leverage and influence people for eternity. He's going to say, hey, what'd you do with the gifts I gave you? Well, I gave my life away to influence people for eternity. What'd you do with the resources I gave you, the treasures I gave you? Well, I gave it away to influence people for eternity. That's the only answer that brings rewards in heaven. The only answer is what we did for people. So quit hoping you'll go to heaven and start helping people get to heaven. Amen, somebody? That's, that is, hey, guys, and until you do, until you quit this whole fire insurance church service, you'll never live in the authority and the confidence that God called you to live. Look at this in Luke chapter 10. Jesus says, in, in talking about the priority of people and really how it's the priority of God. People are God's priority. You know that? It's not, it's not the rest of the stuff that we focus on and put up, consume our life with. People are his priority. And they should be our priority too, church. The Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. And he told them, the harvest is plentiful. You know what he's talking about there? What kind of harvest? People. He's saying, man, there's so many people who are hurting, who are broken, who are lost, who are bound by Satan. And, and but my church, they're not in the field. They're checking in and out at church every week. They're, they're still hoping that they'll go to heaven. They're not helping rescue anyone else from the flames. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. You know what Jesus is saying here? He's saying harvest time is coming where the wheat and the chaff is going to be separated. Look, heaven and hell are real, you guys. Look at the fields. The harvest is plentiful. But he's saying my church isn't gathering the harvest. They're so consumed with their own life, their own issues. They're still hoping they'll go to heaven. They're blind to see the harvest of people separated from God. Hey, we are the church of the living God, the mission arm of heaven. That's who we are. That's who God has called us to be. And until you know who you are, until you quit hoping you'll go to heaven, you'll continue to live in fear or out of duty, and, and, and you'll, you won't be able to prepare for heaven. So quit hoping. Start preparing, church. I don't know about you, but, and if you know this already or not, but discovery exists to reach people. There's, and as long as there are people in our city who are hurting, are broken, are lost, who are bound by Satan, look, we, we prioritize the people who are not here over the people who are here. Because Jesus did that. Jesus came for the lost, not the found, the sick, not the, not the well, the unrighteous, righteous, not the righteous. Just this last week, um, we were, Discovery Church was, was honored to receive this like, I don't know, there's just this cool little thing. They said that we were the 29th fastest growing church in the, in the United States of America. Isn't that cool, you guys? I just thought that was like, I mean, you know why though? It's because we're about people. It's because we see the harvest is plentiful. And God has called us, the church, to be a light in the midst of darkness, to rescue people, not to live with uncertainty or fear, but to be used by God in the harvest field. And if you want to prepare for heaven, not only do you need to answer the first question right, but I want to help you answer this next part, this next question, that you would leverage your life for people, for eternity, for people, for eternity. So let me help you live intentionally. I want to give you three commitments 
Three commitments that we're going to make together, you guys, to, to prepare for heaven. Here they are. Write them down. Number one, that I will intentionally invest in people. All right, God, if it's your priority, it needs to be our priority. And aren't you glad that Je did Jesus make an investment into you? Jesus made an investment into each one of us. And what, he, what God asked for us in return is to reinvest into people. If you're not intentionally investing in people, you will unintentionally use people. And you will inevitably abuse them. Let me say that again. I want to explain that to you because this is important that you would intentionally invest in people because if you are not intentionally investing, making deposits, adding value into people's life, you will unintentionally draw out from people's life. You will intentionally use them for your own goal, for your own ambitions, for your own life, for your own endeavors, and inevitably you'll abuse those people. Look, people are God's priority. They are God's priority. We need to make people our priority and invest into people, invest into them. And I know it's inconvenient. It takes some sacrifice sometimes to invest into people. Sometimes it happens in, in times where it's, it's inopportune to lay down yourself. And, for, and, and, and by the way, people will buy into you before they ever buy into the Bible. Do you know that? That's why we need to invest in people because they, they, people don't care how much you know until they know that you care. All right? So once you invest into people, and you, a lot of people, have you ever heard them say, oh, I don't believe in the Bible? You ever say, oh, I don't believe in the Bible, and you try to quote them the Bible? Well, I don't believe. No, I don't believe in Jesus because, the Bi because of what the Bible says about Jesus. I believe in Jesus because of what Jesus has done in my life, and the Bible confirms it. Yeah. Did you guys hear that right now, man? I just gave you some ammunition for people who said, who tell you in their life, I don't believe in the Bible. Okay? Oh, well, I don't believe in the Bible. That's okay. I don't believe in Jesus because of what the Bible says about him. I believe in Jesus because of what he's done in my life, and the Bible confirms that. That's why I believe in Jesus. And it's sometimes it may be opportune, inopportune times, but Jesus had this practice. Look at this in Matthew 20. It says Jesus stopped. He was on the way somewhere to, to minister in a different, and there were some blind beggars who were calling out to him. And when his disciples wanted to silence them, Jesus stopped and called to them, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus stopped and invested into people even when it wasn't convenient. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul says it this way, that that is how he invested in people. He said, whatever a person is like, I try to find common ground with him so that he will let me tell him about Christ and let Christ save him. I try to find a common ground and you have so much common ground with people. You, so you have the same financial issues, you have the same child issues, you have the same kind of, some of you have experienced loss, loss of a loved one, loss of a parent. But listen, you don't grieve like those who have no hope. So, so you have common ground, but you have hope. That's, that gives you an opportunity to share with people who don't know Christ. I do this to get the gospel to them. And also, look at this, for the blessing I myself receive when I see them come to Christ. That man, when I invest into people, I'm just not pouring in and giving all of myself and nothing's coming in return. No, what I get in return is seeing the harvest. What I get in return is seeing people come to know Jesus, getting their debt paid. So, hey, how do we prepare for heaven, you guys? How do we do that? Well, answer the first question right. But to answer the second question right, you need to make your life about people. All right? Stewarding everything you have to influence people for eternity. So, number one, I will intentionally invest in people. Here's the second thing. Not only invest in people, but I will intentionally invite people. I'm going to invite people. And again, aren't you thankful Jesus invited us? Amen, somebody? In one, in one portion of scripture, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. See, Jesus invited us, and he wants us to re-invite others. I was looking up some research, uh, Lifeway research, says that over 60% of Americans will go to church if a friend invited them. 60%. That means if you, if you were to invite 10 people this week, Six of them will show up this Sunday. What do we do in church? Is, really, is God's priority our priority? Are we prepared? Are we stewarding our life to influence people for eternity? Are we, are we inviting, just inviting people? Listen, the church, you are the hope of the world. You have the light of Christ. God's plan for salvation is you. It's you, 
reaching and inviting other people. I don't know about you, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. I'm going to invite 10 people this week. How many of you are going invite, to invite some people with me? Okay, amen. I'm going to invite 10 people, and I'm going to document it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it on Facebook and social media, and I'm going to show you guys how easy. I'm going to pray with me that six of them. Hopefully I do it well. Hopefully a few of them come. One of them come. It's got to be statistically. Someone's going to come. <laughs> There's something about an invitation, though, that makes you feel special. It makes you feel wanted. It makes you feel accepted. And we can make holy statements like, well, I don't, I don't like beating people up with the Bible. Or how many of you heard this one? I just live my life as an example. Which are both extremely important. Both of those are very important. But, but really what those are oftentimes are just code for I'm scared. I'm scared. And I'm with you. I'm scared. I, it's, it's, it's a little bit nerve-wracking to to make that invite to be used. But I get it. I get it. But look, it's, it's just easier. It's easier to say nothing, to do nothing. But listen, in the end, you will receive nothing. There is no reward. I don't care how much success you have, how much money you make, how much intellect you get, how much church you go to. If you do not leverage what God has given you to influence people for eternity, there is no reward for you in heaven. None. Amen, church? Am I, are you hearing me, you guys? I'm trying to help you guys out, prepare for eternity, you guys, because all of heaven, the Spirit of God is, is, is preparing hearts and souls. The Spirit of God, the heaven is echoing to come and come. And unless we echo back, come, there is no, there's no reward. Look what Revelation chapter 22, verse 17 actually says that the Spirit and the bride, you know who the bride is? That's us. That's the church. That's you. The Spirit, see, the Spirit of God is doing His part. He's preparing the harvest. It's already ready. Oh, look at it. Jesus said, the harvest is ready. People need, they need me. They need hope. They need freedom. They need what we have. The Spirit and the bride say, see, the bride echoes what the Spirit is already saying. But if the bride does not echo it, people cannot hear it. The Spirit and the bride, the church say, what? Come and let the one who hears come. Let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. You have the water of life, church. We have the, all who are thirsty say, echo, the, echo heaven, come. That's the one strategy. God's one strategy for reaching the world is you the church of the living God. And we don't invite people to a religion. We, we invite people to a relationship with God. Can I tell you what God has done in my life? <laughs> Look what the psalmist said in Psalm 66, 16. Listen, and I'll tell you what God has done for me. Has God done something for you guys? Has God done something? You have a testimony, a story to tell? All right. Look, quit hoping you'll go to heaven and start helping people get to heaven. All right. You're the church. You, you, you're not... You, you, if you're living in uncertainty and fear, you'll, you'll, you, will not, you will not be positioned or postured to, to influence people for eternity. And God, you are God's plan to reach a lost and dying world. I hope you take me up on that challenge, you guys, and invite 10 people. Let's fill this place next week. Amen? Here's number three. Not only will I invest in people and invite people, but number three, I will intentionally include people. All right, we don't just invest in them and invite them. No, no, we include them. And again, aren't you thankful that God included you? That he, that, look who Jesus included. Look at the list of the people. Sinners, tax collectors, traitors, okay, power grabbers, complainers, temperamental. Okay, this is who Jesus included. Jesus invested in people first, invited them. He said, come, follow me. I'll change your life. Come. Follow me. I'm, I'll change you. And he included them in the miracle, included them in the process. And it wasn't until years later that they said, oh, wow, Jesus, you're God. You're the Messiah. Oh, I've been coming to church for a while now just because everyone's so friendly. And I just, it's a, but now I get it. Wow, Jesus is God. See, we don't, here at Discovery, we don't wait for you to believe before you can belong. We follow, we follow Jesus' example. And we say, you can belong before you believe. You, you can be included in the process before you ever even believe because you're going to taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen, church? Here's 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 
It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. Some people don't think they can be included or they can include others because, oh, they're just a new, believe they're a new Christian. Oh, they got baggage. They got issues. No, the old is gone. What do you mean you're disqualified? What do you mean you can't? The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us. That term is a financial term that literally means paid your debt, zero balance, bring to zero, reconcile. That God has paid your debt. There's no reason for you to pay it yourself. He's reconciled us to himself through Christ and he has given us, listen, the church, this ministry of telling people, hey, the balance is paid. You don't have to pay for it yourself. The ministry of reconciliation. See, he says, we're therefore Christ's ambassadors. That God was reconciling the word to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. And he is, church. The bride, the church is echoing what the spirit of God is saying, is appealing to the world. Be reconciled to God. Because God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. He paid the debt so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Mark 16, 15, let me end with this. Jesus said to his followers, hey church, quit hoping you'll go to heaven. Quit living with uncertainty. Quit coming, checking in, checking out the church, performing religious duty, acting like that's, that's doing something with your relationship with God. That's, that's not what church is supposed to be. It's not your fire insurance. Go everywhere into the world and tell the good news to everyone. Now, let me say it this way. Quit hoping. Start inviting. You are the church of the living God, the hope of the world. Quit living with uncertainty. Quit living like it's a mystery. Just prepare. Quit hoping you'll go to heaven and prepare for heaven.